get this. I don't know if this mic can pick me up okay. Am I good? I talk really loud sometimes, so I hope that compensates for something. Man, wasn't that an amazing special music? Amen. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, pray that God blesses his word this morning. Uh, Father in heaven, we thank you so much that we can come together and worship with you, Lord. And we just want to pray one more time. That, Lord, as we dive into your word, that, Father, you bless the word that you have given us. Uh, we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, I hope you guys are doing well. I'm on home leave time right now, so I'm still waking up. Amen. Uh, so we have our students kind of out and about, at least our dorm students, uh, and they'll be back, uh, I think, later this weekend. But, woo, I uh, just came back from the beautiful Sedona, Arizona. Uh, while it's still nice, it's like 60, 70, like in the, in the or high 70s uh, there, so it's super, uh, or low 70s, I guess it would be, uh, super beautiful up there, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm waking up, I'm still trying to wake up from staying up late, uh, but I'm happy to be with you guys this morning. I want to talk about what it means to think like a child, uh, but before we get into the topic of conversation, I don't know if this clicker will work okay, all right, we got a working clicker, amen. Um, I wanted to uh, kind of share with uh, my church family a little bit about what's been going on in my life uh, personally with uh, me and my beautiful wife, Alicia. Um, as of, man, I don't even know. Um, I made it official last week when I shared it with the school. Uh, at the end of this year, we'll be transitioning out to um, Andrews University. Um, I got the opportunity uh, to be sponsored uh, by the Arizona Conference to be able to head up there and work on my Masters of Divinity. So that's something that's kind of always been uh, a step in my journey, something I've always kind of looked forward to. It didn't come with a lot of prayer, uh, without a lot of prayer and plenty of tears, amen, uh, and, but we'll be, we'll be transitioning out. However, we're supposed to be back here at the end of those two years, so do me a solid do me a solid. After that, you know, when we get halfway through that second year, you know what I mean, just kind of knock on the door of the conference, be like, hey, remember my boy Zach? Hey, let's bring him back here to good old AZ. Uh, don't forget about me. I know they get busy there, over there at that conference, so I just want everybody to remember, hey, remember Zach? Yeah, don't forget about me. Uh, I would love nothing more than to be back in this church community, amen? So I'm not going to make it, I'm not going to drop any more hints. Other than that one right there, uh, but Alicia and I are very thankful for the church family and the church community we have developed in our time here. It's been very special, um, and it's been absolutely amazing. When I think back on my ministry journey, when I, you know, talking about baptism, I got baptized in the Glendale Seventh-day Adventist Church, and I was there for maybe a, a three or four years before I came here to Thunderbird Academy, and ever since then, Scottsdale Thunderbird Church has been a big part of my church family. So many of you have had that impact on me, and I would like nothing more, hint, hint, to come back to this community. You know? uh, so anyways, I just wanted to share that with the church family this morning. Um, we're, you know, we're just trying to follow God's leading in this journey and just praying and hoping that we're going where he is leading. Um, but speaking of talking like a child, I don't know how many of you have great childhood memories. Anybody can think back to a, to a good childhood memory I think childhood, yeah, we, we, we share a lot of memories. Um, a lot of who we are came from the process of development through childhood. Um, very quickly, uh, we're going to talk about what the Bible means to be like a child. But I remember growing up, I loved my childhood years, especially being the only child for so long. I had mom and dad's attention regularly. All attention was on me, and I loved it. Um, I loved it. And then there was my brother, my sister, and then my life changed drastically. No, I'm still traumatized, still recovering, still recovering, no. Uh, but I just remember the, the, you know, the, the, the freedom that I had as a child. And I remember my favorite part of my childhood was before school. School traumatized me. And I remember even growing up and liking the idea of playing school. I would go to the library and I would ask, I, didn't, I couldn't even read. I hated reading, okay? I, I, like many of our young people nowadays, I just love playing video games and watching TV and doing my thing. And I remember I would fake, I would not fake, I would check out these books and I would act and pretend like I was going to school, but I never actually like enjoy the actual process of school, amen? And uh, so many of us, I believe in the same way, are challenged on that end in our spirituality. Sometimes we like the idea of it more than the actual practice of it. 
someone gets up and shares about it and we're, we're open to the idea of it, but when it comes to the actual practice of it, we struggle with it just a little bit. And I remember one time, you know, growing up, uh, one of the things that I really sucked at doing was doing my homework. Can anybody else relate? Uh, I was horrible at doing my homework. As a matter of fact, you know, I would come home and uh, my mom would be like, you're going to work on your homework. And I'm like, oh, mom, my homework's already done. I don't know how many of you parents have heard that day in and day out. My homework's already done. And my mom's like, well, your grades reflect otherwise. And I'm like, well, calm down. You're attacking me. I don't like that tone you're taking with me, mom. And uh, so what my, what my mom started doing, and this is, you know, being a teacher has taught me, you know, just so much. Um, you know, with the whole parent-teacher relationship thing. Uh, and my mom would go to my teacher and be like, Zachary's saying he has no homework. You keep saying you're sending him home with something. Where is his homework at? And I remember one day specifically, it was after school, I was getting ready to be picked up, and my teacher took the homework that I had for the day. She specifically unzipped my backpack and put my homework inside of it, and she said, Zachary, your homework is in here, okay? I can't make it any more specific. So she took my homework, she put it in my backpack. Well, as soon as I went home, I took my homework, threw it in a trash bag, and threw it away. And my mom was like, where is your homework? I'm like, I didn't get any homework. Uh, this, is my dad, this is why my dad joined uh, law enforcement to become a detective, to figure these types of things out, because I just lied my entire childhood about doing my homework. Um, but realistically, um, yeah, I just, I, I did not do my homework and I wanted, I, did, I didn't want to step into that reality of what it actually meant um, to grow, to mature, um, to be a, be a part of this process. If you join me in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, before we get into the sermon this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, looking at verse 11, the Apostle Paul says, When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I understood as a child, I thought like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. There comes a point in our faith where there's this process of growing, this process of maturing. And I don't know about you, but I remember when I was in the third or fourth grade, I had a conversation with my friends, and they were talking about playing with toys. And it was one of those situations where, like, I don't play with toys anymore. Do you play with toys? And I was like, oh, no, of course not. Like, who would play with toys? I'm too big for that, right? Um, realistically, I just still love playing with my toys. But it was this idea that it's time to mature. And Paul says it spiritually too. There comes a point in our Christian faith where we begin to progress into the next thing. Starting in Matthew chapter 18 this morning, the disciples are with Jesus. And Jesus is their teacher. Um, he refers to us as his children all throughout, uh, all throughout the scriptures. And so his disciples are asking him, they say, Jesus, uh, so at the time, the disciples came to him saying, uh, to Jesus saying, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? This is that childlike mentality, right? We're going to talk about behaving like a child versus what it means to be a child spiritually. What is Jesus talking about? Um, they said, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And growing up, one of the things I used to always fight for in school was line leader. Okay? Because if I were line leader, I'm the head of the pack. I'm on top. I am the greatest. You know what I mean? doesn't matter what all you think of me. The teacher chose me, and I am the line leader, so get thee behind me. Amen? And so uh, I, I just felt like I was the greatest. Now, the disciples here, what we have to understand is the disciples are sincerely asking Jesus a question. But behind, behind every question, there's an actual seeking, there's an actual question of what they're seeking to ask, which is, what can they do to actually be the greatest? Now, if any of you read the book of the Desire of Ages, Ella White makes this argument, and it's actually in Scripture as well, that Jesus had just shared with the disciples that they, all 12 of them, would rule over the 12 tribes of Israel in the new kingdom. So he already said to them, you've given up so much for me. You've left your friends. You've left your jobs. You've left your family to come and follow me. And I assure you, you will rule with me. But for a disciple, that is not enough. What can I do to be the greatest of those rulers with you in eternity? And even James and John, their mother, just trying to be a good mother, going to the teacher, heads over to teacher, Rabbi Jesus, and says, Jesus, what must my sons do 
to sit on your left side and to sit on your right side, to be the greatest, to rule with you. And Jesus says, that's not for me to give. But this idea of being the greatest was a big part of their mentality. Looking on to verses 2 and 3, the Bible says, Then Jesus called a little child to himself, set this child in the midst of them, to be there in the middle of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is taking them back to the basics with this understanding. They're arguing who will be the greatest, and Jesus is just trying to get them past the pearly gates. He says, you're thinking to next level right now. You're wanting to be here, and I'm just trying to get you here, okay? He's saying, I, I tell you, unless you change your heart, unless you become converted and you become like a little child, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So you're thinking about what it takes to be the greatest, and I'm just trying to get you into this kingdom of heaven. Now, with this idea in mind, one thing we have to understand about children back in the day, and even maybe children now, but back in Jesus' time, children had no rights, right? They couldn't vote. They really didn't, their opinion didn't matter as much. They didn't really, they were completely dependent upon their children. So what we know Jesus is not saying is, I don't need you behaving like little children. I don't need you acting like a little child specifically, but there's a certain mentality, there's a certain posture, there's a certain way you can position yourself spiritually to receive what I am giving. Now, in the early 1800s, there was this Christian group um, that believed Jesus came for the second time spiritually. And they believed in order to really experience this reality, they had to go around acting like little children. Just like crying and throwing themselves around and behaving like little children in order to enter into this reality. Jesus is not saying we need to behave like children or have the maturity of a child, but we need to position ourselves like them to be completely dependent upon him. To be humble in complete humility subjecting ourselves to him. Um, he goes on to say, therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven because even as much as a little child may want to be the greatest they are still dependent upon the parents so a child could want what they actually want but it's up to the parent to give them what they need and so jesus is trying to get us into a posture spiritually where we need to humble ourselves to a point where we are dependent upon him for everything amen this does not mean that we do not fend for ourselves. This is why Paul says, hey, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I acted like a child, but when I became a man, I put away those, those childish things. He's trying to get us to another level of understanding. Um, in Matthew chapter 23, verse 12, Jesus also says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. In the Christian experience, it's not about who is the greatest, but it's who is the humblest. Who is willing to serve this community rather than be greater than the people in the community? In religious times, people wanted to be a Pharisee. People wanted to be these religious leaders who held positions in high places. But these religious leaders lived for themselves versus serving everybody around them in this vicinity. Ellen White says this, In the kingdom of God, Position is not gained through favoritism. It is not earned, nor is it received through an arb arbitrary bestowal. It is the result of what? Character. What God is more concerned with in our culture and with who we are in the church is our character. Not necessarily what we are doing, but he's very concerned with the process of who you and I are becoming. When the rich young ruler approaches Jesus and he says to him, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He, his emphasis on, it was on what must I do, not who do I need to be. Jesus was more concerned with who he was becoming versus what he was doing. God is more concerned with 
our character, we can say, versus how we are performing. I want to take a look at a certain character in Scripture, Isaiah chapter 14. This idea of being the greatest, the idea of being this childlike community. If you look back in the Old Testament and you see Israel and you kind of follow their story, this is a kingdom of people that's always concerned about being the greatest in society. But that mentality of being the greatest actually hurt them. They were captives to the Babylonians, to the Egyptians, and they were always fighting to be to the greatest, but they were behaving like children, not being dependent upon him as he actually wanted them to be. Ellen White says this same spirit came from this character in scripture, Lucifer. The passage reads, How you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you have been cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mountain of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet, I will bring you down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. Here's the beautiful thing about humility. If we don't do it, who's going to do it? God is going to do it. God will take care of it. He'll humble us. This desire came, as Jesus said to the religious leaders of the time, from their father, Lucifer. This desire to be the greatest, to assume those positions of greatness... As Lucifer said, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne, I will sit on the mount of the congregation. It wasn't for Lucifer to do any of those things. He's not the main character in this story. He's simply a participant with what he's been given in that context of where they're at in eternity. Think of the Babylonians. When they try, or not the Babylonians, when they, in Scripture, when they try to build the Tower of Babel, what does God do? He confuses the language to humble them. When King Nebuchadnezzar says, I'm going to make myself the greatest leader within history, God humbles him to become like an animal. He's on all fours, as dumb as an animal, eating like animals. He makes fun of them within history. All throughout history, what God is looking for is for a people who won't necessarily think about status or position or what it takes to be the greatest, how to secure those positions, but a process of character. Who are you becoming versus what you are accomplishing? We know that from this passage, Lucifer desired God's power, but he didn't actually want his character. He desired his power, but didn't want his character. What we need more than anything, I believe, in these times, especially given the context of the situation that we're in as a church community, is we need to be more like Jesus than anything. Rather than desire uh, positions of influence and authority, we need to become like little children and desire to be like Jesus spiritually, to have his character. Little children responded to Jesus when he came to them. They they liked him. They wanted to be like him. And rather than have the power, we need to focus on his character. Now, speaking of the most humblest person in the world, someone who, you know, just exudes humility regularly. Philippians 2, 5, or Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 7 says this. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who... Being in the very form of God did not consider it robbery to be made equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Jesus gave up his position of power and authority, came to us. He didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped. He said, I'm not working towards it. I'm not trying to secure it for myself. I don't want more of it. As a matter of fact, he said, I am going to give it up, which for me is why he was the perfect man for the position. He was willing to sacrifice it, making himself in the form of a bondservant. So he made himself even less than us to serve us. So if you think about it, this is why in the Last Supper, Judas had such a hard time washing his feet. He had such a hard time washing his feet because he says, no king, no master of mine would ever lower themselves um, to this position to serve me. This isn't right. He was willing to give all that up just so he can relate and serve you and me. This is the character of God. And this is how his kingdom works. 
It's not solely on the base of his, of his power and authority. It's his character of serving. That's the type of humility that I believe God actually wants to see within you and me. Who are we becoming versus how are we performing versus what we are accomplishing? What is our character becoming like? The Bible continues, and being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even to death on a, what? Cross. Complete shame. He was willing to sacrifice his reputation. He was willing to sacrifice that name. He was willing to take that embarrassment upon himself so that God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that every knee shall bow and that every, uh, those in heaven and those on earth, those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is what? Lord to the glory of God. So this is why God exalts him and this is why we worship him. Not because he demands it from us, but because he gave it all up for us. So it just makes me wonder in our spiritual journey, when we're focusing on what we're doing, what we're accomplishing, are we succeeding, how are we performing, is humility a big part of what we're doing? Are we willing to humble ourselves to become who God wants us to be versus to just do things that brings attention and recognition to me? This is that level of humility, humility where I believe God wants us to be. Amen, church family? Otherwise, we are no better uh, than these children who are constantly fighting childishly for these powers of authority. What we need to do regularly, spiritually, is to give that up to God because we want to be more like him rather than just be him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, this morning, um, it's just been an impression upon my heart with where you're leading um, as I read, uh, you know, as I read through scripture, Lord, when you come back again, what you're looking for is for a people that serve you, for a people that love you, for a people that actually want to be with you, who love you for who you are and not just what you do. But Father, this spirit is so prevalent within society and even of ourselves, Lord, of accomplishing great things, of trying to, uh, you know, do all these things when in fact all you want for us is to become more like you, not just do great things for you. And you distribute, you display this, Father, by giving up all authority when you were in heaven. Because what was more important to you, what was more important to you was that you love us and serve us and make us more like you rather than us mindlessly or arbitrarily serve and bow our knee to you. You came to serve us, which is why when we come again, we will all bow to recognize you because it's for who you are, Lord. Um, Lord, we pray that we can have this spirit in our lives. We pray this in your name. Amen.